Hello, I'm Thomas Hughes with Coder, and today I'm going to talk to you about how we're bringing DevSecOps to the developer workspace. So this is me, I'm a senior DevOps engineer with Coder, and before this I was over at GitHub as a senior DevOps engineer in professional services. So I've spent a lot of time with companies all around the world in highly regulated industries, also the startups, enterprises, government entities, all of that, and really did uh, a lot of work with them to help improve workflows, developer culture, uh, things like that. So um, you can definitely check me out at imhughes.com or reach out to me if you have questions after this. For a brief overview here of our agenda, so um, DevSecOps, I, I want to talk about DevSecOps, but I want to talk about and, and paint the picture of where we came from as well. So what did that look like before the DevOps, DevSecOps movement? What did software development look like and uh, how does that process change? And then again, what Coder has been doing to help continue to uh, increase that process. Um, you know, with that old model, lots of problems that were there and, and lots of things that need to change. Uh, we came out this idea of shifting left, which I'll go into. Um, what, you know, what does that even mean to shift left? Why do we do this? Um, I'll go into DevOps itself and how DevSecOps specifically solves this problem. And then how Coder is actually moving DevSecOps further left in this SDLC pipeline. Uh, finally, I have just a kind of couple points that I wanted to call out about DevSecOps uh, transformations within your organizations. If you want to roll this type of program out uh, to do a digital transformation within your company. And I'll have a little conclusion Q&A session uh, available afterwards. So when we talk about where we came from, it's important to note the development process uh, before DevOps. So, you know, basically the way this started here and the way this diagram is laid out is we had some type of coding process, a testing process, a deployment process, maybe a couple deployment processes as we uh, promote the code to the different deployment environments. And all of these things were handled by separate teams that really didn't have the best communication. Um, lots of silos, lots of manual processes, and more of a waterfall approach that really led to kind of throwing the blame over the wall in a sense and saying, okay, the developers code and then we throw it to the QA team. QA team does testing, maybe they need to throw it back to the developers. Um, you know, then they go back and forth in uh, long discussions about the actual quality of the code and if it's a bug or a feature and all those fun things. Finally, QA deploys it to ops, but then ops deployment doesn't look the same as a QA environment. So there's lots of discussion there. And there's just, you know, basically this idea of silos. Now, when it came to the security teams, uh, it was even worse. It was even more segmented, more silos, more manual processes, and things like uh, being able to do reporting was very manual. Um, scanning of code was manual. Uh, doing things like changing a security policy or, or a configuration. Again, either completely separate teams, se uh, separate entities, uh, and often very segmented where there is a lot of process and, um, and, again, manual pieces to this. So not a very efficient or automated way that we would want to run something like this. So just to throw it out there, the main problem, if I haven't alluded to it enough yet, is, is silos. So, you know, we have all these happy faces in each team here and everyone in the developer team's happy, the QA team's happy, your security team and ops team, but we have these huge walls between these teams dividing them. Uh, in this process, as I mentioned, you know, a developer might go through and say, okay, my code's ready, I pushed it up, ship it off to the QA team for testing. The QA team's gonna say, all right, well, we ran our test, we, uh, you know, we're failing on smoke and sanity testing, we are, uh, seeing integration issues or end-to-end -end test issues and things like that. So let's go ahead and throw this back to the dev team now and get some better explanation. There's just kind of a lack of communication there because we have these literal walls that are being built. Uh, I, I guess figurative walls, not literal walls. Sometimes literal walls in uh, the terms of cubicles and things like that, right? But basically just this passing of blame back and forth that leads to a breakdown of communication, breakdown of collaboration, and uh, less traceability overall. Similarly, our security teams are being completely segmented as well. Instead of being really integrated into the entire development process from start to finish, they were kind of an afterthought done later on in the process. And finally, the poor ops team is sitting there deploying out the code and they really have no control. They're at the complete end of the pipeline now. And if they're seeing something in a production environment or a near production environment right before promoting it, um, you know, they're just really dealing with the manual process of rolling back code and redeploying things out and, and things like that. It was just uh, not the best time. 
So furthering this point on just other problems that occurred, uh, security is another one. So GitHub's data science team actually came out with this report in the middle of 2020. Um, so, you know, basically what we're showing here is uh, what might just kind of make common sense, I guess. But as lines of code have increased over the years, so taking a look from April 2015 to April 2020, we've also seen that the number of security threats has either increased uh, in the exact same rate or it increased at a faster rate than the lines of code. So what that means is for every line of code I write, there is a near one-to-one -one relation, sometimes one-to-two relation, where the line of code I write, also a brand new security threat comes, uh, possibly more than one security threat comes, right? And the point of this is that we really want to show that uh, just in the last five years alone, it, it's quite shocking seeing that the, these lines are starting to converge, which means there might be more security threats coming out faster than we even write the code to fix them. Uh, so what does this mean? You know, we, we need to eliminate the manual processes. We need to uh, work harder. And this is kind of where this idea of DevOps and DevSecOps comes in to start automating these processes, really helping us with um, with not slowing this curve of, of security threats necessarily, but detecting them earlier and, and helping uh, our developers find out about this. So that brings me to this idea of shifting left. So, you know, across the top here, I have a very typical SDLC diagram that you'll often see with the different stages of the software development lifecycle. Uh, you know, at the beginning, we're going to do some type of project planning, uh, maybe a stakeholder meeting or something like that to determine the business requirements for a feature or an application or something like that. Uh, there's a design phase where maybe some type of architects will start laying out the high level uh, infrastructure, the database needs, things like that. Uh, we have our developers coding. Uh, we have the test portion of it as well for our unit integration and end, end testing. Uh, we have our acceptance testing, right? Uh, making sure that after the code ships, maybe there's a business analyst that's reviewing and, and ensuring that, yes, this is the uh, the sign off that we needed to make sure that this functions exactly what what we thought it was going to do uh, in the requirements that we defined at the beginning of this process. There's some type of promotion where we ship this out to the production environment, whether that's a uh, boxed and shipped product or a SaaS product that we're updating live. Uh, and then there's a the maintenance period, right? So after it's deployed out there, we need a way to track bugs, make sure things are operational, we don't have downtime, and all the fun things that come with running uh, software. So this entire span here applies, while it's linear, and you might think waterfall when I have it linear here, uh, this applies to all development mindsets, whether it's like an extreme programming, scrum, agile, uh, buzzword here, buzzword there. Um, you know, the idea is this is a cyclic cycle, whether it's from a start to finish uh, waterfall that has very long processes or a uh, more short two week sprint basis or something like that, uh, that you're going through these stages. But the idea of shifting left is taking this linear process and taking the, the end pieces and moving them further left along the diagram. So uh, in layman's terms, you know, moving things like the QA and security processes earlier into this SDLC process. And that way we can get more automation um, around uh, instant feedback or more, more quick feedback, I should say, uh, to the developers. It winds up being a lot cheaper uh, to fix these codes that I'll talk about in a moment here. Um, sorry, to fix these coding mistakes or, or bugs and security issues, uh, as I'll talk about in a moment here. Uh, and really, the other cool thing about this is this allows for uh, collaboration between the teams and more importantly, between projects as well. You get a lot more reusability. Uh, this concept comes out now of, you know, quote unquote, as code. Uh, so you might have infrastructure as code, configurations as code, pipelines as code. Um, you know, all these different things allows you to to store and write a documented, traceable, templated way to repeat our processes in an automated fashion. So you're not doing the single point of failure of the one person that's been there 10 years that knows the entire test suite like the back of their hand and no one else knows how to run this thing. Uh, or the same thing could be said for a CI CD pipeline or, or something like that. So, you know, again, in layman's terms, we just want to shift left the QA and security processes so we get earlier detection of bugs and security issues and be able to find out, um, you know, how to fix them sooner. So why? Why do we care about that, right? Uh, this seems like a, a lot of work and puts more work on the developer. They're going to be dealing with more test results now, security results, and trying to do all this stuff. I just want to ship my code 
why am I even worrying about this? So uh, I think it would be you know remiss if I didn't talk about uh, the, the why here and really kind of showing the importance of this and how this is really going to help you and your organization out in the long term. So first of all, the earlier that you find a bug or a security flaw in your software, the cheaper it is to fix that problem. So what I mean is um, it's, it's easier to fix it, right? If I just shipped a new feature or I just wrote code for a new feature and I instantly have a unit test fail, I understand, okay, hey, something I just changed is um, causing an, an issue somewhere else in the code, whether it's through a uh, integration test or the unit test that I wrote for the specific feature itself, right? Uh, maybe you're fixing a bug and you wind up causing a regression in another area. So again, you know that code that you shipped or, or submitted or committed uh, has now caused a bug to show up somewhere else. And because we have this failing early concept, that is we're, um, you know, again, in the development process, but having QA automations run, having security automations run, uh, we're able to tell that, hey, okay, if we're no longer failing at this early stage, we have a lot more confidence in our deployment to promote it into maybe our staging environment or a pre-prod environment or something like that, or possibly even going out to production. So, um, you know, basically all these automations save a lot of time, they save a lot of money, and more, most importantly for uh, the developer itself is it's going to save you on future technical debt. Um, you know, I worked at a place where I was a uh, test automation engineer and I was doing some consulting type work on the side with it, where I was uh, finding that every sprint I had a developer in uh, each engineering team, it, you know, never failed. Every single sprint they would say, I need to allocate 10 to 20 hours of this sprint for bug fixes and interrupters. And those interrupters were, oh, hey, that bug came back again. Hey, yeah, that thing that we saw last time, I think the new feature messed it up and now, now we're seeing it again. We're getting uh, new bug reports for that. So, you know, those types of problems um, aren't fun. You know, I wanna ship new stuff. I wanna ship new features as a developer. I don't wanna sit here and, and go through someone else's code and try to fix the bugs. And, you know, while you're never gonna catch anything or everything, excuse me, um, you know, finding these things earlier allows us to uh, reduce the the later technical debt that builds up of this you know potentially poorly written code that is really not going to work with other integrations and other parts of the code base and things like that. Um, you know, because we have this this confidence here that our our code is at a higher quality because we're able to find uh, the bugs and security issues uh, earlier. This allows us to ship faster too. So, you know, as a organization, I always want to ship faster. I have competitors out there that are trying to ship faster and get more features to our end users. So the faster we can ship, the better it is for our user base, which is the better for our bottom line, of course. Uh, and then finally here, if you uh, was reading ahead on the slide at all, you might've noticed some interesting points in that final bullet point. So um, one of the things that's most interesting and also scary and exciting, I guess, at the same time uh, that I really love about the QA world and, you know, security and just things like that in general is, um, you know, the, the history of just cases where lawsuits happened. Um, unfortunately, people have lost lives over this type of stuff and even the nuclear war aspect, which I'll talk about in just a moment here. So in the first two that I listed, the Theric 25 and Panama City, these are real cases you can look up if you'd like. Uh, but they're known as some of the, these are all known as some of the top uh, like failures in QA basically. Um, so the first two have to do with uh, cancer patients that were receiving radiation treatment via a software that ran this, you know, radiation hardware, uh, let's say. Um, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so <laughs> don't take this as medical advice. But unfortunately, there was a bug in uh, these systems that basically allowed the doctors that were delivering the radiation or the radiologist or whatever you want to say, um, it wound up causing a higher dose than intended of radiation to the patients. Uh, it was something like eight to ten times what they were supposed to be receiving. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in these cases, a few people passed away uh, from radiation poisoning and multiple people were hospitalized and able to recover, luckily, uh, from that radiation poisoning as well. Uh, and what's really scary is in uh, some countries and depending on the circumstances of the situation, uh, one of these cases, I believe it was the Panama City one, the two developers that were responsible for the software bug were actually held personally responsible for the deaths and, and damages of uh, the injured folks as well. So, um, you know, definitely not a great experience um, as a developer to, to know that the software you worked on caused something like that. Uh, the next one on the list, Patriot Missile System. So uh, this is another somewhat famous one. Uh, I, I'm a veteran, so uh, this one hits home for me. But 
in layman's terms, again, the, the Patriot missile system is a surface to air missile that uh, basically is used to intercept uh, incoming enemy missiles. So if uh, someone launches a missile at us, we can use this system to shoot our own missile and they'll collide in the air, blow it up, etc. Um, this relies on GPS technology, which is extremely important to be very precise and has a timing element as well, right? It's not just the coordinates, but it's, uh, you know, what is the, the rate, uh, maybe the meters per second or feet per second that this uh, object's moving and how are we going to intercept it? And all those calculations have to happen. Uh, what they found is with the Patriot missile system, if it was left turned on for uh, a period of time, I believe it was more than 24 hours, so not a very long time, but if it was more than 24 hours, the timing uh, uh, component would start running into some type of issue where it would be out of sync. Uh, and by the end of, let's say, a week of it being turned on without being rebooted at all, it would be so far out of sync that their missiles would completely miss their target. And there was actually a case where, again, sadly, uh, an inbound missile attack came, our Patriot missile system fires off, it winds up not intercepting the incoming missile, and it hits a military base that injured about 100 people. So, you know, again, just this idea of QA and quality, that software had a bug in it that caused the injuries of 100 people. Um, just very, very crazy. And the last one that I like to mention, which is really, really interesting to me, uh, during the Cold War, between uh, mostly the Soviet Union and the United States, obviously lots of other countries involved in that as well. I want to be inclusive here, uh, but there was this huge threat of of nuclear war. You know, we're, what's going to happen if there's World War III and nuclear war, and everyone's on high alert and always watching out for missiles to be launched and whoever's going to launch first and all this type of stuff, right? Uh, so. In a Russian observation post, they had software that was scanning uh, some type of radar software, I believe, looking for inbound missile attacks. And there was a uh, alert that said there was a missile launch from the United States heading to Russia. So they called the general or colonel or whoever it was, the ranking official that needs to make the decision. And the officer said, if America attacked us, there would probably be more than one missile. So I think that's a bug. So literally... Uh, you know, according to the documentation on, on this story here, nuclear war was prevented based off this officer's decision, but we could have had a automated process potentially catch that bug that would have prevented nuclear war. Like just imagine how that could have gone the other way and just how scary that is. So, um, all of this to say, not to be too scary about it, there's there's so many different lawsuit type things. There's things from uh, Intel CPU manufacturing having to recall millions of units and costing them millions and millions of dollars. Uh, you know, lots of things like that. But I think these are the most impactful ones that uh, I always I always think about when I talk about quality in just terms of of how important it is to really find this information out early on in your process to reduce the cost to fix, the time to fix, and uh, you know, again, potentially even save lives and and stop uh, lawsuits. So. Uh, definitely important stuff. So I'll move on from that topic here, though, and uh, talk about fixing these problems so we don't have to deal with this. So what is DevOps, right? That's the point of our talk is DevOps and how is this solving our problems for us? So uh, DevOps itself is this concept of connecting teams and people together. We want to increase the collaboration. We want to automate processes. And we want to have consistent operations and processes, which, again, leads us to that X as code, quote unquote, type of thing. Infrastructure as code, pipelines as code, uh, coder does workspaces as code, as I'll talk about in a moment here. Um, we want to be able to have these, these configurations and things like that very readily available to be deployed out in a repeatable manner, in a traceable manner. Um, doing it this way means that we're going to be reducing the friction between teams. We're going to allow more feedback, which allows more collaboration. And it basically breaks down those silos and walls here. We're stretching out the, the operations piece across the entire development process now, not just having it at the end of the line. So DevSecOps builds on that concept, and now we're adding in security teams to this automation process as well. We want the security arm to reach across the entire SDLC process now. Uh, so if you think about automating security threats and automating security processes with uh, static code analysis and stuff like that, uh, this is going to reduce all the potential, or not all the potential, I guess, but reduce the surface area for uh, potential leaks and breaches because we're, we're finding these vulnerabilities early in the process rather than waiting for it to get to a beta stage or a pre-prod stage or even production. Um, you know, this again allows for collaborative changes. So I can open up a pull request and have a discussion about this configuration change because it's 
it's all as code now. So my policies, my configurations on my network switches and things like that can all be documented, which means it's traceable, it's auditable, and we can see the exact discussion of why these decisions were being made to make the policy and, config and configuration changes that we made. So pretty important that we can we can do these processes. And we see DevSecOps uh, encoder as being an extremely important piece, but it does stop at the developer piece where they kind of uh, you know do their same thing that they've always done on their workspace. And the CICD pipelines and all the automation piece kind of happens on the QA stage, but not the developer stage itself. Um, yes, I can run my unit tests locally and things like that, but this idea of automating these processes and getting a consistent and uh, configurable auto Auditable, redeployed workspace has not been done uh, in in a previous realm, really. So at Coder, we're seeing that we're able to shift DevSecOps further left and actually include the developer's environment and workspace itself now. Uh, so with Coder, we have something called Workspaces as Code or Workspace Templates that will be a YAML file that's very easy to read, is documented, can be handled by a DevSecOps team or the admin teams or the developers themselves in charge of the project where they get to specify which uh, Docker container they need to use, what hardware requirements they need. So something like uh, eight cores of RAM, or I'm sorry, eight cores of CPU, 16 gigs of RAM, uh, you know, 50 gigs of hard drive space or something like that. Uh, and because it's a templated file that's as code in that very familiar YAML syntax, we're able to version co control that. We're able to have pull requests around the discussions. We're able to do the full audit trace. And then everyone's normalized on the hardware that they're running on. So I did mention that this does use containerized development environments. So while that concept isn't super new to containerize and build, a, or, or I'm sorry, code within, let's say, a Docker container, uh, Coder is actually running on Kubernetes, though. So we allow for the expansion and, and uh, you know, the full orchestration, basically, of your VMs that are running one to uh one or more pods that have your development environments in them. Those development environments are pulling from a base image that's been hardened and scanned and is part of our private registry possibly or part of Docker Hub or something like that, where we know that everything that's inside of that container is the exact tools that a developer would need to get started on a project. Uh, so that's gonna have my IDEs in it. It's gonna have my dependencies, my uh, coding languages. Uh, so, you know, Python 3, and specifically I need this one version of Python. Or I have a node project, and uh, this is an older node project, so we're on node 12 still, um, that type of thing. The other cool thing is that uh, this, this means that as a developer, I don't have to worry about setting up my workspace locally at all. And we have demos of this on our website. I'd love for you to check it out at coder.com, but you can actually set up a developer workspace for a project without downloading anything at all. Just logging into, let's say GitHub or GitLab and then going through and actually, um, you know, configuring the entire thing with like a click of a button. Basically it takes less than five minutes. Uh, the other cool thing is since we're on Kubernetes, we run anywhere Kubernetes does so we can be fully air gapped, uh, completely segmented off of the the main you know cloud infrastructure out there, which means that for your highly secured environments that need to be completely on prem and separated from the public internet, we support that. We can integrate with your uh, private registries, your private databases, and all of that. Uh, keep it all behind your firewall. So it really helps with the zero trust environment. It really helps with, um, again, the regulation and consistency of these environments. And if you think about it, we can even take this containerized environment and use that same container in our CICD pipeline. So then we have a like for like environment and we're seeing less uh, separa uh, separation from the developer itself and the um, the actual end result that we see in like the QA pipeline or the uh, deployment pipeline or something like that. Um, finally, the other really nice thing about this is, um, you know, again, I have all the tools that I need in the container, right? So how many of you have gone out there as a developer and maybe you're working again in Python or Node or Ruby or Go or something like that, where you have projects that span multiple versions. So you might be working on one repository where uh, using Node as an example, maybe it's a really old repository, it's still using Node 8. Uh, okay, cool, we're on Node 8. So let me download NVM and I'll manage my local environment to uh, point it to Node 8. And then I'm working on another project, that's Node 12. So I have to remember to go back to NVM, change it to Node 12 now. 
Uh, and then we have another one that's on node 16. So, okay, let me go back, NVM, change it to node 16. And the same thing happens across all languages, right? So, um, you know, there's there's this PyEnv, there's uh, RVM, NVM, there's so many different tools out there just for managing your local workspaces. And as a developer that's onboarding to a project or just as a developer that's been working on a project, I don't wanna deal with that. I wanna do what I do best, I wanna code. So being able to uh, eliminate those pieces and, and make it a lot more simpler for our developers by having less configuration, less setup process. And again, basically this idea of a click of a button to deploy out a full workspace onto a Kubernetes pod without me having to do any thinking behind it at all after it's set up uh, is, is really powerful. It just allows me to ship my code faster and not have to deal with as much uh, locally. So if that's interesting to you, again, I would definitely check out coder.com. We have a really good video on the homepage. You'll actually hear me speaking again, uh, showing setting up a, a React project in less than five minutes. Um, but of course, this works for all sorts of languages and things like that. So wrapping up here, a few pro tips that I like to bring out. So um, when you're starting a dev drop, uh, sorry, a DevOps transformation within your organization, there's a lot of things you need to consider. So, so many organizations, especially the large enterprises out there, are trying to catch up to the younger startups and trying to move forward. And they, they've heard of these things like DevOps and DevSecOps, and they try to do a top-down approach of really pushing down, okay, you're changing this, we got to start being agile, we have to start shipping faster. Uh, I would very much encourage you, if you're rolling out a DevOps transformation, you're the stakeholder for this or something like that, Start with why. Um, as you noticed when I was going through the slide deck here, and I believe these slides are going to be made available for you as well. So, you know, please look at that why slide where I really discussed why we're doing these changes and why we're doing the transformation. All change is hard, and we need to remember that the core piece of any change that we do, including DevOps, is going to be the culture itself and the people behind there. Um, you can buy all the tools you want, you can have all the licenses in the world but the people behind the scenes are the ones that are gonna be using those tools. So you might have the absolute best DevOps tool that's ever been made in the world, uh, but if you don't have buy-in from the people that are using that tool and it's not a good experience for them and they don't know why they're even doing it, you're gonna have problems. So we just need to remember, um, again, that that core piece is that culture change um, is gonna be from, from the people itself that are working on this. So to do that, uh, or to that point further, some of the things you can do as you start rolling out new tooling and new processes, new workflows and stuff like that, is uh, taking this concept of a lighthouse team. I actually talk about this on my blog as well, but basically a lighthouse team is, let's say that smaller agile team that's working on a new project that isn't a 20 year uh, legacy code base or something like that that's moved from clear case to subversion to git and has all this history in it and lots and lots of uh, you know nasty stuff that's spaghetti code as some people would call it right so we take this lighthouse team instead they're working on a new project it's on git it's uh, you know a lot more lightweight it doesn't have all that bad history and possibly even has uh, younger developers that are used to some of these new tools and workflows already they can pilot these types of tools out. So if you're in introducing Coder, they can give a pilot for it. They can actually work through some of those initial barriers and some of the some of the problems that might come up in your organization, since every organization will have those specific issues. And as that smaller project gets to uh, gain success, you're able to start then rolling it out and you have a lighthouse or a beacon pointing you in the right direction of, hey, yeah, we figured out 75% of the problems that we're gonna face. And there's always gonna be the large legacy project that maybe has some special nuances to it that just this either doesn't work for or we really need to think about. But if we can take away 75% of that load by using a pilot team or a lighthouse team, that really helps us out. And it's a lot easier for us because it's a smaller project, a smaller team, et cetera. Uh, finally, the last piece that I wanna talk about here is just Collaboration. Remember that uh, DevOps and DevSecOps is all about collaborating, breaking down those silos, and really having a culture where you can foster collaboration and encourage that is going to be important. So wrapping up, we talked about where we came from, these huge silos that existed, very segmented manual processes uh, where teams were just kind of passing blame and throwing it over the wall. That problem led to this concept of shifting left, which led to DevOps and DevSecOps, which is basically automating and reducing these silos, bringing the operations and security teams closer to the developers. 
Coder is taking a look at this and we said, okay, DevSecOps seems to stop at the CI CD pipelines. How do we get the developer workspace involved too to free up the developers and allow them to do more and more uh, actual coding and less configuring of their local environment, figuring out why it works on my machine, it doesn't work on someone else's machine and, and going through those rhetorics there. And then we just wrapped up with some rollout plans as well. So uh, that said, if you have any questions for us, we would love to hear from you. You can reach out to us at contact at coder.com. We are also at www.coder.com, of course. We have that homepage video, as I mentioned, demoing it. We're on YouTube. We do monthly live demos. Uh, we have a lot of content available in our blog as well and different white papers on things like zero trust and container development in general. So we'd love to hear from you and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you and hope to hear from you soon.